Grace and peace may be multiplied unto you uh, as we get ready to transition into another year. There is a word from the Lord, and not only a word, but there's a revelation from the Lord. For those of you that have the word of the Lord with you, turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter uh, 61. Isaiah chapter 61. And I would like to look at verses 1 and 2. And I'm reading to you from the standard King James Version. And the scripture declares thus, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison of them that are bound to claim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Now, if you would still hold your finger there, and I would like to tie another scripture to this, um, the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, and the scripture declares thus, and keep this in mind, it's in red print, meaning that Christ is the one speaking these words. Amen. And the scripture reads, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Verse 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. If I had a title to give uh, for this occasion, the title would be the acceptable year of the Lord. Amen. The acceptable year of the Lord. In bringing these texts to your attention, notice that uh, we have the text referenced in the Old Testament or Old Covenant as well as the New Testament or New Covenant. Old Testament wise, the scripture is being referenced by the prophet Isaiah and New Testament wise, it is being resurrected in a matter of speaking by Christ himself in the temple. Uh, the reason that the Lord has given me this text is as we 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 come upon the transition from 2015 to 2016, there's something about the year. And I want to bring some revelation this evening so that uh, people will understand that watch this. It's not the year that drives us. It's us that drives the year. Many of us have been going year after year, month after month, day after day, letting dates on the calendar drive you. And you begin to make uh, resolutions based on January 1st versus a revelation based on Jesus Christ, a revelation based on God or what God has been declaring for your life to transition into eternity. So God has given me this word to begin to, to dissect a man for those that are listening. Amen. So if I can, even though I've read both texts, I'm going to break this scripture down uh, to give you some revelation about what is really the acceptable year of the Lord. Uh, amen. So, let me begin to look at this from um, the New Testament. Uh, when Jesus is speaking, Yeshua is speaking, he opens up the scripture and keep this in mind as well. Notice, as I said here previously, Christ resurrects a scripture that's already written. So this has been something that has already been in another human being like you and me, the prophet Isaiah. And so what happens, it had already been proclaimed into the atmosphere as 
Amos 3, 7 says, surely God does nothing in the earth unless he reveals it to his servants, the prophets. There's some things that have to be prophetically spoken into the atmosphere in order for them to create themselves and become the reality in time. So what I want you to understand is Isaiah is the forerunner that speaks this or writes this for the record. And then Christ begins to speak it again in the hearing of those who are willing to listen. Amen. So now let's begin to look at this scripture. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Let's, let's look at that right there. It says the spirit. Okay. Now understand when we talk about spirit, the Greek word that's used there is pneuma, which, uh, 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 is the breath. It is the essence. It is, it is, it is, uh, uh, part of the identity or the character of God. Amen. Because as we understand, God is a undefinable entity. However, he uses his spirit to articulate his character. So the scripture says the spirit of the Lord is upon me and see, we've got to have this in clarity. All right. Y'all got to listen to what I'm saying right now. When we talk about being upon me, we ain't talking about like, some people are thinking like a bird descends on somebody. The word upon means up and on. So the spirit of the Lord is upon me due to the fact that this is a character. This is an element or this is the, the, the DNA of God that's hidden within each and every one of us that's waiting to manifest. Amen. When the spirit of the Lord is, 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 is activated, it comes up on you and covers you as your covering. It becomes the mantle. It becomes uh, 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 your dress. It becomes it becomes uh, your clothing. It becomes the essence of what people see. So Isaiah first said it. Jesus says it here again. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Okay, let me stop right there. Understand this. I want to make sure some people got this crystal clear because see what happens is some people we got to make sure are not still fooling themselves and saying that they in the spirit of the Lord understand by these scriptures, it is a prerequisite of certain things to be manifested in your life in order to declare that the spirit of the Lord is upon you. See, notice here, Christ, when he says the spirit of the Lord is upon me, he says, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Okay. So be it that there is an anointing that is associated with his life. And it's the same thing with the prophet Isaiah. This is what activates the spirit of the Lord to come upon us. See, you ain't going to get the spirit of the Lord just to do nothing. Hear me. Somebody better hear me right there. You're not going to get the spirit of the Lord just to have it and say, I got it. I'm good. I G I, I, I'm good. Uh, uh, I G T. I got this. The spirit is with me and I ain't got to do nothing with it. No, there's certain things that activate it to come on you. And he says here in the scripture, he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. So the spirit of the Lord comes upon him in order to preach. Hear what I'm saying in order to, uh, uh, uh preach the gospel. Now, in order to preach it, there's an anointing that goes along with it. Amen. Hear what I'm saying. The word, uh, 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 uh anoint comes from the Greek word creo, which means to consecrate or to smear. And as many of us are here in an understanding, when we think about anointing in the natural, we, we, we think about oil. Watch this. Let, let me bring you some deeper revelation on this, because think about this. When we get anointed, especially when we do services to consecrate individuals into the offices that we believe God has, has activated them to operate in, we use oil. Anybody ever ask themselves, why is oil being used? Well, let, 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 let me go ahead and answer the question for you. The oil is being used because watch this. Oil is an element that is combustible. Let me say that again. Oil 
is an element that is combustible. You should begin to put this together. God talks about being a consuming fire. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, we talk about the spirit uh, being symbolized by a flame. So watch this. If I got the anointing of God on me, then it's something that should put me on fire. The Holy Spirit that I have that represents God is, is articulated by all because it's symbolizing that I should always be in a combustible state. I should always be in a place that I can be put on fire. I should always be in a place that, 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 that I'm ready to burn because even the scripture says that we are a living sacrifice. If I'm a sacrifice, then it means I'm placed on the altar and there are things that are happening that are causing some things to be burnt in my life. Watch this. I'm, I'm, I hope I'm giving somebody something right there because see, you've got to understand this. If I am going to be anointed, then there means there has to be some things that I went through. There had to be some rough times. There had to be some ups and some downs because see, anointing ain't something than just easily given. There's a process that I have to go through in order to recognize the progress of having the anointing manifested on my life. See, anointing ain't something that's just easy for a looky-loo, for somebody that's just watching the show. There's some things that we have to go through and some transitions that have to happen in our life in order to validate that the anointing is there. So see, I have to understand, as the old folks used to say, sometimes you have to be in the kitchen and when the kitchen is hot, you jump out. But see, I'm understanding and speaking prophetically to somebody that as the kitchen gets hot, as we're spiritually saying, you need to stay in there. You got to stay in the fight. You got to stay in the struggle. You got to stay into your valley. You got to stay into the, 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 the hard place. Or as some folks used to say, but the, is stay between the rock and the hard place. Because see, what's happening is that's validating the anointing that's being placed on your life. So now he says here, he says, uh, 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 because he hath anointed me or, or, or made me combustible in order to preach the gospel to the poor. Let, let's, let's begin to look at that for a minute there. He says to preach. Watch this. Can I, can I teach you right here? When we talk about preaching, preaching uh, 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 is more than what everybody thinks. OK, because nine times out of ten, many people that are in the presence of the Lord right now, we think that preaching means uh, to be from the pulpit. We think that it means that we've got to get behind uh, a pulpit or get up on a stage and speak in front of folks. But watch this. Preaching is about having passion. See, understand this. There are many people that, that, that have passion about certain things in their life. So if you're going to be a preacher, it's only you heralding or having a passion about something that you have no shame in the game to tell to somebody else in order for them to get or receive what you got for them to receive. And in order for them to, to, to feel the same passion that you have for the subject that you're delivering. Because see, understand this, as I said, here previously, I'll say it again. Preaching ain't just about preaching the word of God. Watch this because think about this. I'm going to keep this simple like Simon. If somebody is a mechanic, amen. If somebody is a mechanic, watch this. If somebody came to them and asked them a question regarding an issue going on with their vehicle, what will happen is the mechanic won't usually give them the simple answer. Y'all know what I'm saying is true. What happens is they will not only give them the answer to the question, but they'll give them all the details of the process of some of the stuff that may even be beyond the thinking capacity of the individually that they're helping out. So what does that say? What happens is usually somebody that hears them will say, will you stop preaching to them? Cause they'll go on and on and on and on because they're passionate about what they do. So watch this. Let me give you a revelation. Preaching is about once again, you being passionate about something that you do. So if I've got passion, 
passion behind what I am saying I'm preaching regardless of being in a pulpit I could be sitting in a car I could be sitting in Walmart Kroger's I could be sitting in a car lot preaching can be done anywhere at any time at any place by anyone with a passion of something so what God declares here especially as Christ is speaking he says that he has been anointed or placed on fire in order to preach so understand this somebody should be listening right now that this applies to you in your struggle in your process especially as we're talking about the acceptable year of the Lord in your struggle of everything that you go through there should be some things that you are passionate about that you come out squeaky clean after the process is done so 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 let me let, let me say here he says to preach watch this the gospel to the poor okay what is the gospel what is the gospel okay now the Greek word for gospel is eungalian all right eungalium or eugalio is to declare the good news to declare good tidings okay but now let me be prophetic instead of pathetic with saying that when we really get into it what the gospel is is nothing more than the god spell let me roll that back and say it again the gospel is the god spell watch this we have to understand this i want to want to make sure it's crystal clear see depending on the things that you go through Something dictates how you think, all right? Because nine times out of 10, you're either in a place of obedience or you're in a place of disobedience, all right? For some of you that are Bible readers, you remember Samuel said disobedience as, as being under witchcraft, okay? What is witchcraft other than mind control, okay? So understand this, all right? The God spell is God's control or possession of you in order to preach or teach or, or, or operate according to his will. See, many times people are in a place of disobedience, so they're not operating in the gospel or the God's spell. Okay, because you think about it, a lot of times we keep running around here. I always want to tell folks that we under grace. Well, what is grace? Grace in the Greek is charis, which means divine influence, i.e. mind control or possession by the spirit of God. Some people are, are not under that, but you have to understand this. God wants to possess you just like demons do. When you're in a place of disobedience, you either under, under control of, of demonic spirits or you're in your own flesh. And when you're in your own flesh, then there ain't no room for God to coexist in your mind and be on the throne in order to possess you and drive you into godly influence or grace. So understanding this, understanding this, he says, preach the gospel. I, I, I have called you to herald or be passionate about the God spell. See, if we, depending on what I have operating in my mind will dictate what I have a desire to tell other people about. And if, if, if my mind is always in a good place, if my mind is always under the God spell, then that means I'm going to talk about God. I'm going to be passionate about God to those that listen to me or take the time to hear what I've got to say. If I am not passionate about that, if I'm not under the God spell, then I'll be passionate about everything but God. Okay. Stick pin that right there. So now. Scripture says, let, let, let me get back to this. Ah, uh, he says, preach the gospel to the poor. All right, now, let, 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 let me still continue to flow with some deeper prophetic revelation here. See, right here, many of us are, are kind of under the mindset of, of uh, as, as we would call in theology, Antiochian hermeneutics. All right. There's two there's two primary school of hermeneutics or way of interpretation. OK, there's Antiochian, which is literal. And then there's also what is called Alexandrian, which is spiritual. All right. Though those uh, uh, schools of thought were derived by Peter and Mark. OK. 
Peter started the church of Antioch and they translated uh, scripture or the Holy Writ, i.e. the Old Testament, by literal terminology. When we talk about Mark, Mark started the, the church of, of Alexandria. And when he started the church of Alexandria, we're talking about Alexandria of Egypt. It was centered on spiritual or gnosis interpretation, which also ties itself by the Jews and the Sanhedrin uh, uh, and the old church of the Old Testament, or, or should I say, uh, of the rabbis and so forth with with spiritual interpretation of scripture okay so what where, where I'm trying to carry you where I'm trying to carry you in this year of understanding is in a spiritual place because unfortunately even though we claim to be spiritual individuals in God but we only have natural understanding that is why a lot of people right now under the sound of my voice are broken in getting into a deeper place in God because God is a spirit and the thing is we have not matured ourselves in spiritual understanding we're still trapped in natural. So that means there has to be a spiritual word that is sold into you in order to give you an awakening. There has to be a spiritual understanding or interpretation that comes and brings you into a spiritual place. If we're claiming to be spirits and if we're claiming that we have the spirit of the Lord up on us, amen, it should, it should be causing our, our natural to to deactivate and our spirit to activate. Okay. So the scripture says now, let me, now I can really clarify this thing about the poor because many that are listening right now are saying, okay, when he talked about the poor, he's talking about folks that aren't well off folks that don't have money, people that don't have finances, people that don't have resources, but I'm going to take you into a deeper place of understanding because this word poor, uh, comes from the Greek word tokos, which means powerless. Okay. Powerless. All right. So that says this, Here's, here's where we we're getting a revelation. The anointing comes uh, to us or is given to us in order for us uh, 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 to be uh, on fire and have the spirit come upon us. All right. We are supposed to be passionate about the gospel or the God spell because the God spell is what gives us power in God. And the thing is we've been come, we have, we have been anointed and the spirit is on us in order to bring power to the powerless. See, there's many people that are disconnected from God, not only those that don't have a relationship with him, but there's also some that, as the scriptures say, that are dead in Christ. There are some uh, 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 it, that are in the body of Christ, but yet they don't have no power. They haven't been activated. They don't know how to exercise this thing. As, as, as I've given a revelation before, there's three forms of power. There's dunamis power, which is your natural power to walk, to talk, to move your arms. There's exousia power, which is the power of influence. And then there is what's called kratos or kriotis power, which is dominion. So the thing is, there's many people that are right now powerless meaning they ain't got no dominion power because they're not operating their exousia power with their dunamis power in order to be in dominion power. So what the scripture is saying here is that the spirit has been activated on us to operate and be passionate about dominion power, about operating in the right exousia power so we can plug some other folks up and get them uh, getting power again. It's just like you having a lamp in the house or, 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 or having a TV or a telephone. They can't do nothing for you. They have the ability, but what happens is they can't do nothing for you until they're plugged into a power source. Once they're plugged into a power source, now they can be utilized for their potential. So ha e shut What God is trying to do, uh, even through this scripture, is for some people to get hooked back up into the power source okay okay so now he says there's a semicolon here it says he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted 
All right, let me stop there. He has sent. Can, can I give you a revelation here? Watch this. Right here, Jesus even articulates the fact of his apostleship. All right, somebody might have missed that, but let, let me clarify this. When he said he hath sent me, the word sent is apostello or apostelos, which is the same word for apostle in the Greek. And when we understand apostle, what is an apostle other than one to bring order or to set in place? Okay, as we really get deep, when we talk about apostle, we say one who is sent or one who is sent to send, meaning the apostle is one who looks for the diamond in the rough. They're not only sent as an ambassador on God's behalf, but they have uh, uh, the anointed uh, ability to look into other people's lives and see the potential that's hidden within them that they can't see for themselves. It's just like looking at coal. Coal, we can't see the diamond in the rough until it's been worked out. But somebody has to believe in that piece of coal and that the right amount of pressure can be applied in order for the diamond to come forth. So once again, I watch this. He says, I was sent or I was apostolized by God, by the anointing that he's given me in order to heal the brokenhearted. Because see, watch this. Some folks need some healing. All right. Can, 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 can we still be deep here? Some folks need to be he, uh, uh, healed. And watch this. If we're talking about healing, healing ain't talking about no Band-Aid. Yeah. Hear what I'm saying. Some of us are still one dimensional because we think healing applies itself only when somebody is injured. OK, but now spiritual healing is not only to fix the injury, but it's also to make you whole. OK, let me roll that back to heal spiritually is to make whole. It, it, ain't, it ain't just to, to, to give you a quick fix. Healing by the word of God ain't meant just to use some neosporin and say that you're good to go. What happens is somebody has to be made whole. Watch this. Somebody should have a yoke broken right there. Because now I've taken you to the next dimension of understanding what God's healing is all about. We're thinking that it just has to do with the hospital. What I'm talking about is making you complete. Because see, understand, if you're made whole, this ties itself to what the word of God talks about when it talks about perfecting us. Perfecting means to mature. How have we matured or recognized the maturity in the spirit unless we're made whole? Okay. 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 We're still dealing. We're still dealing here. The acceptable year of the Lord. The acceptable year of the Lord. All right. So then he says, I was sent to heal who? The brokenhearted. Let me take a moment right there just to deal with that because I want, I want to make sure that those that are listening have this clear as well. When we talk about the brokenhearted, watch this. There's two words there, broken and hearted. All right. Now, we talk about broken. We mean to shatter, shiver, crush, or separate. All right. Y'all should be getting something here because it kind of is like the poor. The poor are powerless because they've been disconnected or they've been broken. Okay, now here's the thing with heart, though. Understand the word heart in the Greek is cardia. All right, which is where we get cardiac arrest when we talk about people having heart attacks and so forth. All right, the Hebrew word is leb. Now, have any of you ever asked yourself, why does the Bible always talk about the heart over and over again in many of the books that are canonized in the Bible? Well, I'm glad you didn't ask because I'm going to give you the revelation anyhow. Watch this. The reason that heart is used over and over uh, is, is due to the fact that it ties to your thoughts. Hear, hear what I'm saying. The word cardia in leb in the Greek and in the Hebrew means thoughts or your understanding has nothing to do with the organ inside your chest that pumps blood. But here's, here's where that connection is. Some people don't know 
that, believe it or not, whenever you're asked a question, your heart rate speeds up in order to answer. I could ask you a simple question, uh, a yes or no question, and in order for you to give me the answer, yes or no, what happens is your heart speeds up pumping blood through your veins and through your body in order for you to say yes or no. It speeds up whenever you're processing your thoughts in order to answer any type of question or engage in a conversation. So understanding this, what happens is the scripture says that I have been appointed or I've been apostolized in order to heal those who have been disconnected in their thoughts. What happened is those who are poor, those who ain't got no power, tie themselves to the ones that don't have no thoughts. They've been disconnected from God. Everybody that doesn't have a relationship with him or are not seeking him or are not talking to him are in a place that they have been broken hearted or broken in their thoughts. How many right now are broken in their thoughts? <sighs> See, why, why is it that we're broken in our thoughts? Well, as uh, Psalms 8 says, Who is man that thou art mindful of him? Okay. If God's got a mind full of you, when will you have a mind full of God? The more that you have the mind of God, the more that the mending and the anointing and the process begins for you to have the spirit of the Lord upon you. But there's some people that are spiritless when it comes to God because they don't have a consistent mind path of thinking about God. So it requires those who are passionate about him to Plug them in to have the same passion. Until then, they are still going to be broken in their thoughts. That is why, that is one of the, 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 the prerequisites also for the anointing to come upon individuals who are passionate in God. So they can restore the mindset of those who've got a broken mind. Okay. All right. So now the scripture says to preach deliverance to the captives. Okay. Watch this. Can I, can I, can I still teach here? It says to preach. All right. Once again, we've clarified preaching, uh, curioso, which means once again, to herald or proclaim deliverance. All right. Which is liberty or, or, or forgiveness. All right. Because some people have to have uh, uh, put into their hearing that they can be accepted by God. All right. They can be forgiven because, see, a lot of people, uh, if you really think about this, are in a place of condemnation. And condemnation is not about you tearing yourself down. It's actually about separating yourself from God. That's why the scriptures talk over and over about how how the children of Israel divorced God, because in their thinking, they separated themselves from God. But God never separated himself from them. OK, so now let me say that again, as it applies to you. Often you will in your in your in your thinking or in your broken thoughts, you continue to justify yourself and separate yourself from God versus God separating himself from you, which is why he's got to send or dispatch somebody to to speak into your hearing to empower you once again. Because the word says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Or as a man thinketh in his thoughts. Well, what do you think other than what you hear? So if this word says by two or three, let everything be established. There's some things that you got to hear over and over again, at least two to three times in order for you to begin to receive it and transform your mind in how you think. So what happens is he says here that, that I send them to preach deliverance. I send them to preach. Uh, forgiveness. I send them to preach liberation. I send them to preach uh, uh, or, or proclaim what you need to hear in order uh, to come out of your captivity. Well, 
Why do you need to come out of captivity? Some have to understand what captivity is. Many of us are thinking that captivity is just about being in bondage, but watch this. In the Greek of the word that's used here in this scripture, it means prisoners of war, okay? Why am I a prisoner of war other than the fact that I've been in a war? See, understand this, being a prisoner as it is implied here is not about me just coming and, and grabbing you like a police officer on the street, throwing some handcuffs on you and then taking you to jail. Watch this. What is implied here spiritually is you. Let, 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 let me give an example. You're a soldier and you go to war. So you are on the battleground fighting a battle for an extensive period of time. And then sometime later, after you've been in the war, you are captured and put in, in bondage. There is a difference that, see, under, understand this, some people don't even know that they've been fighting a battle for an extended period of time. And see, this is what the liberation has, has been designed for. Because since our, our insemination, since our creation in the natural of coming into this realm, we have been fighting a lifetime battle that we have not even recognized or engaged ourselves to think on. Paul says that, that uh, 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 we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Okay, some people are saying, okay, by the scripture that I'm going to be uh, engaged in a fight, but you got to understand you already been in the fight. You was in a fight when you didn't even know you was in a fight. You was in a spiritual war. When you were still in your flesh, some have not really had a revelation right now that you have always been in a spiritual war, even when you was a fleshly person and wasn't even thinking about the spirit. The thing is, when you had the awakening of, a, of, of the spirit of God to come upon you and that you're seeking after him, now you can look back over your life and think things over. Now you can look back and see, wow, I was in a spiritual war all this time. I just never knew that I was, I was getting beat up. I was getting tore up until now. So this, this, is what, this is what happens here. He says, I send deliverance to the captives, those who have been in the war and are now in bondage or now coming to the revelation that they've been in bondage based on the war that they've been spiritually fighting for the duration of their life. So then he says, and recovering sight uh, to the blind. Let me tag that right there. Okay, I hope somebody is still listening to me. All right, so he says, recover sight to the blind. Recover means restoration. Okay, restore. Meaning there was a sight that we had, it just had to be given back to us. All right. For those who are the anointed that are coming, they're speaking about sight that you already got. See, understand, all of us have a prophetic element about ourselves. In Ephesians 4.11, we talk about fivefold ministry, all right? And we talk about the prophets, okay? Now, understand, the prophetic is the exercising of the, prof of, of, of the prophetic voice. It's, uh, prophetic means to exercise prophecy. Understand this, though, if we're going to exercise prophecy, we got to understand that things go back to our original design of who we are. We have all been designed with a voice to speak some things and, and, and call those things into existence. But the thing is, if we don't understand that, then we'll never put it into activation. And see, the thing is, a lot of us uh, don't know that we're prophetic, especially if we're calling ourselves to be servants. Amos 3, 7 says, surely God does nothing in the earth unless he reveals it to his servants, the prophets. So if you're going to claim that you're a servant, then you're also claiming that you're prophetic. You're claiming the prophetic element is on your life. So, so in that, as he says this, we have to understand that there is a sight that goes along with those who are being recovered in the spirit. The sight ties itself to a prophetic ability. If anybody knows anything about the prophetic that's listening to me, the prophet is the one that sees things. They operate with their hearing in conjunction with their sight, but their sight is what 
what they are articulating to the people who are listening under the sound of their voice. So in that, if you're going to become passionate about God, it requires you to have some spiritual sight. There's some things that you need to be able to see or i.e. discern in the earth realm, especially as we're going into another year, not only another physical year, but watch this, a, a, a prophetic year, a spiritual year that we've already been in. See, watch this. Your body right now is only catching up with spiritual time. See, this ain't nothing about a new year. As I, as I said here earlier about uh, 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 it's not the calendar that drives us. It's us that drives the calendar. It's not that we got to wait to January 1st in order to do anything spiritually or prophetically on God's behalf. We're already doing it when it has been introduced into our spirit and we began to see it or discern it in spiritual places. Amen. So, so now he says, uh, deliverance to the captives and recovering sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised. Those to see, watch this. Even as we begin to have sight restored to us, it also becomes the avenue or the gateway for us to be liberated because spiritual sight or discernment is what we're going to need in order to continue in the process that God has us in or living while we're in natural time. Natural time has bound us physically, but spiritual time is, is pulling us to eternity. So it requires us to be liberated in our sight in order to move into our complete liberation as a whole because until we get to that we will still find ourselves in some form of bondage so watch this as we're still saying that God is still bringing the spirit of himself upon some people to 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 bring to liberation people it requires them to be in a place of spiritual understanding in a place of spiritual deliverance in a place of spiritual uh, uh, ability in order to move into the next dimension and as they move into the next dimension it's not just for them individually but it's for everybody that has a desire to see the anointing that's placed on them and become combustible themselves so now it brings it brings me to the punchline it brings me to the punchline verse 19 verse 19 says to preach the acceptable year of the Lord all right to proclaim all of this in order to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, let, let, let me hold it right there because I need to clarify something to you. We talk about Lord. We understand Lord in the Greek is kurios. Same thing as the Hebrew word Adonai, which means Lord or, 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 or sovereign. A, a man, when we talk Lord also, we, we think Yahuwah, the existent one. When we, when we, we talk Lord, we, 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 we talk Curio, supreme authority. Okay, but watch this. Here's, here's what I want you to get a real revelation on, especially as it ties to the title of this message. It says, the acceptable, to preach or proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Okay, now. For those that are listening, I want you to get this very clear. Every time you see the word of in scripture, whether we talk in Old Testament or New Testament, the word of really means from. Okay, let me bag that up then. So you grab this. To preach or to proclaim the acceptable year from the Lord. Okay, what am I saying to you? Okay, understand this. Let's look at that word year. The word year, when, we, when we, we think about it in the Greek, is anoitos or anos, which is a pyramid, a period of time or a regiment of time. All right. Time, as we understand, is in the natural. OK, but now let me remind you, Christ quoted the scripture or the writings of Isaiah from the Old Testament. All right. Now, here's the thing. Year in the Hebrew 
is Shane, which means a revolution of time, division of time, or watch this, a lifetime. Okay, why am I emphasizing this to you? Okay, let me, let me touch something with time with you very quickly, and then hopefully this revelation will come together for you. The Egyptians, Romans, and the Greeks understood two different timetables. They understood Kronos and they understood Kairos. Kronos is chronological time, 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, 365 days in a year. Amen. All right. Then you have what's called Kairos. Kairos is appointed time or destined time. It ties itself to eternity. Now, in that, if I, if I can simplify it so you can really grab this, you think about when uh, some time in your life when you prayed to God. And what happened is, imagine God pulling out a tablet, looking at, at the cal his calendar on the tablet, and in what you prayed for, he puts it on that calendar. All right? Now, in that, you're still living in natural time. All right? God has put it in Kairos, which is appointed a destined time. You're in Kronos, chronological time. All right. So as your life has gone on, you've been thinking that you was denied because you hadn't seen the manifestation. Okay. Watch this. You really was delayed, but maybe not denied because watch this Kairos and Kronos, like I said, are two different timetables. So imagine a straight line on the floor. You're walking out that straight line in Kronos, all right? But however, in front of you, somewhere ahead of you on that line is a point that God calls Kairos. And what's supposed to happen is they're supposed to meet. But many times we, get, we, we deviate. Somebody pulls us off course and we pull ourselves off course. And so we don't catch up to what's been put in Kairos in the time that we would expect it while we're walking in Kronos. So what happens is sometimes God has to move it back because if you get it too soon, you might blow yourself up. Other times we deviate and cause ourselves to miss it. And the thing is, that's why the scripture talks about repent. And when we understand repentance, it, it means not only uh, uh, to ask for forgiveness, but it means to go back to the point where you got off course and start over again. But unfortunately, a lot of us on this Kronos and Kairos timetable, we believe in Kentucky windage. We try to adjust uh, and get back on course from our lost position. Okay. So now understand if I get back on course and I begin to walk the line, now, the more I stay straight on the line in Kronos or natural time, God begins to allow what he's already placed in destined time or eternity to move towards me. And then what happens is when they meet, it's what's called a high Ross. That's when you get to praise. Y'all know you, you, uh, something manifests for you. Then you're ready to get your shout because now it has lined itself up and it's come together. So God could continually has Kairos and Kronos destined to come together. I should be giving somebody a revelation. Watch this. Now that you understand that, here's, here's where you get a real revelation. The thing is, yes, the world is running out of time, but us that are believers that are in the body of Christ, we're running out of time too, but we're running into eternity. Eternity is the new timetable or Kairos that we're headed for. The people that are not in relationship with God aren't headed for Kairos or eternity because they're only living in the moment. They're only looking for what they've got in the now until time ends for them, i.e. death comes. So, so now that I've explained this with, with what, what, what time is, catch this in the Hebrew when we talked about the word time, time here uh, uh, means more than just a, a regiment time. Time here implies uh, a, a revolution of time, or should I say something that begins in natural time, that, but it continues the duration of natural time into eternity. So now, 
Here's the punchline of understanding what the acceptable year of the Lord or from the Lord is. It's about you getting accepted, i.e. receiving salvation. When I receive the salvation or get delivered to God based on what he's given from himself in natural time, now I stay on course in the time that I'm in until I reach eternity. Because, see, understand, God is not driven by the calendar and you shouldn't be driven by the calendar, too. What happens is everything that you start, you proclaim and declare in the spiritual realm or in the heavenlies, it starts the clock then. It's not started by a calendar. It's started by what you declare. It's started by what you proclaim. Oh, oh I, somebody should hear me right there. It is started when you accept God because God has accepted you. See, you can't have an acceptable year in him until you accept him because he's already been willing to accept you. Once you have accepted him, now your life begins. You have a new life. We talk about a new year. It's talking about a new life. When I start a new spiritual life in him, I begin to walk that thing out in natural time. But the thing is, it becomes a duration of a lifetime process. It's a lifetime process that continues and transitions over into an eternal process that I live and exist with him in eternity, more so than me living and existing in natural time. So this is what thus saith the Lord. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. It's about you receiving him or, 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 or accepting him as he has accepted you so that now your time in the natural begins to lead you towards your eternal time in him. Amen. Blessings. I pray that each and every one that has heard this word receives it and is able to be blessed as we have now stepped into another year and another life in him. Amen.